I am not a paranormal investigator. I am an author. While looking for inspiration for a book, I came across a series of stories surrounding a home in the American Pacific Northwest. It is an extremely ordinary looking house in an extremely ordinary looking residential neighborhood. But the stories that have emanated from its former residents and the people who lived in the town that it's located in are quite extraordinary. Through my research of the house on Wendell Lane, I have come across accounts that range from the supernatural to just plain bizarre. In order to protect the privacy of the people in the town and the current inhabitants of the house on Wendell Lane, I have not only changed the name of everyone in these stories, but the name of the street as well. Wendell Lane is just an alias for the true location of these accounts. This is the Wendell Lane Diaries. In early September, I received an email from a source that did not wish to be identified by name. The subject line in the email was titled, Wendell Lane, the phone in the kitchen. Normally, I don't open emails regarding the house from people I haven't contacted, but curiosity got the better of me, so I opened it up. This is what it said. Mr. Kaba, first of all, I'd like to say that I enjoy your work, and I'm happy to hear that you're thinking about writing a book about the house on Wendell Lane. The reason I'm writing you is because I know that you've been researching the house, and I believe I have some information that you might be interested in. I'm sending you a journal entry written by David Porter, a man who lived in the home between the years of 1984 and 1987. I will, of course, also be providing you with all the necessary documents to back my claim. One final request. I implore you not to release my name. This document was obtained illegally, and I do not wish to incriminate myself. The calls would come from the phone in the kitchen. Always the phone in the kitchen. If the other phones rang, I could expect to speak to someone who was alive. But if it was just the kitchen phone, then I knew the caller would be dead. They came at odd hours, too. Always early morning, before the dawn would break. I had known them all when they were alive. They were relatives and friends, co-workers, neighbors. Each and every one of them were people in my life who had passed on to the other side. Some of them I got to know better after they died than when they were still alive. My uh, grandmother was one of the first calls I received. She was dead before I turned 12, so the two of us had a lot of catching up to do. Nana became one of my closest confidants. I shared everything with her during our calls, all my secrets, all my hopes and aspirations. I felt blessed to have such a gift bestowed upon me. A telephone line to the afterlife. And though I couldn't dial out, it always seemed like there was someone calling me when I needed it. I was never given an explicit set of guidelines, but uh, there seemed to be rules that all the callers followed. Never did our conversations last until daybreak. It uh, didn't matter if I was in mid-sentence, the callers would hang up as soon as the sun started to peek out over the horizon. Never would the callers speak of the afterlife. And it didn't matter how hard I pressed them. Each and every one was a master at pivoting the conversation away from the topic. Lastly, never was I allowed to tell another soul, even my brother Danny, whom I was closest in the world with. These were small prices to pay, of course, a phone line to the afterlife <laughs> meant I never truly lost anyone. And then my brother's accident happened and everything changed. Danny's car hit a patch of black ice on the freeway and he lost control. By the time I got to the hospital, his wife and children were already there. Danny was in critical condition, but he was fighting for his life. His injuries were too numerous to list. I looked into the terrified eyes of his family and felt a strange sense of shame. I wouldn't be losing my brother that night. Even if he couldn't pull through, he would still talk on the telephone in the kitchen. For his wife and kids, though, He'd be gone forever. Didn't seem fair. I needed to speak about it with someone, someone who would understand. So I excused myself for a little while, drove home, 
and sat by the phone. It rang after about 15 minutes. It was around 3 a.m. at the time of the call. I'd been expecting my grandmother, but when I heard the voice on the other line, I felt my heart drop. It was Danny, which could only mean one thing. He'd passed. He was in a relatively pleasant mood for a man who had just died. Believe it or not, he seemed more interested in counseling me than grieving over himself and his family. We spoke for two hours, until just before the crack of dawn, and he comforted me with his words. I felt much better about myself after he'd hung up. No longer did the shame weigh so heavy on me. Danny had been able to alleviate the burden. I drove back to the hospital to meet his family. His wife and kids were strong people, and deep down in my heart, I knew they would eventually come out of the tragedy okay. But when I got back to the hospital, I was surprised to see Danny's children smiling. His wife was chipper, too. And she said that shortly after I left, Danny had begun to recover. He was doing so well, in fact, that the doctors had already downgraded his status to fair. I was dumbfounded. If Danny wasn't dead, then how had I been talking to him? According to the doctors, he had regained consciousness before I made it home. We were told my brother would make a full recovery, and were allowed to talk to him later that afternoon. He was in good spirits, and I was happy for him and his family, but the whole situation had left me more than a little disturbed. I waited once again in eager anticipation for my next call from the other side. I'd been sitting at the kitchen table for an hour when it finally rang. It was around four in the morning. I picked up the line. It was my brother again, or at least someone who sounded just like him. I let the voice speak for a bit before I cut it off. I informed it that my brother hadn't died in the car wreck the previous night, and that I no longer believed it was genuine. I tried to continue its charade for a bit, but eventually conceded. I'm just so lonely, it told me. Please, won't you still talk to me? And now its voice sounded just like my grandmother's. I can be anyone you want me to be. That was all I needed to hear. I pulled the phone from the wall and tossed it in the garbage bin outside. Even still, it rang until daylight. I didn't dare answer it. All this time I thought I was speaking to lost loved ones. But something had been playing me. Something that knew me very well. Something that I confided in. I wonder sometimes what I actually was speaking to on the other end of that phone line. But the more I think about all the intimate phone calls we shared, the more I believed I'd rather not know. Michigan. That's my hometown. Been put an end to this horse bucky once and for all. Whatever happened in this town seems to really haunt him. Ash, I had to summon you. Help me retrieve the book and send them back to hell. Oh, you need my help. Here's what I need. I need to be back in Jacksonville on my second keg of beer, putting my spicy man meat into a mother-daughter sandwich. Part of me is already regretting calling you here. Get used to that feeling. We gave peace a chance. Now it's time for war. Whoa! Oh! Oh, <laughs> 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 
die like all the others. Ladies first. <laughs> That is horrible and also awesome. Which is everything that I do.